Well, congratulations on being the last one standing um, or sitting, um, as the case may be. I promise you that the theme and the speakers in this uh, last session of Undisciplined are going to be sufficiently uh, intriguing and interesting that you will completely forget that they are the only things standing between you and the drinks that are currently chilling in the Courtauld fridges. With the theme of perception, we sort of come full circle um, to approach the question of what our discipline is um, and what it does. Um, in a much more broad sort of perspective. How do those outside of art history perceive our discipline and have we done enough to articulate um, the value of our discipline, discipline uh, the value of our ways of looking at things, um, our modes of perception and how they benefit other disciplines and the wider world? And then this session addresses some of the questions that art historians really have to engage with um, in quite a public manner um, if we're to preserve our discipline. Because we've already internally debated the sort of the more ontological questions of what our discipline is and the subject matter of, of art history. And we've come to, well, somewhat comfortable um, impasses um, in terms of uh, what constitutes our subject matter, the things that we should be looking at and talking about. We've pushed the boundaries of what we are including within our canons and we are continuing to push the boundaries of the questions that we're willing to ask of those objects um, with the help of a little uh, postmodern fairy dust, of course. Um, but other questions impose themselves on us from the wider socio-economic context in which we work, work, such as is it worth pursuing a degree in art history? Um, is it a finishing school for the cultural elite? Or are the skills that you, are you come away with essential to society? Who is art history for? Why should we fight to maintain art history as an A-level? Um, and why should we push for its inclusion in state schools? But in the age of the hyper-production, the proliferation of the image and just stuff in general, skills and close looking and an ability to engage with what we're looking at critically is more important than ever. And yet art history continues to be undermined and the humanities more generally. And yet, on the other hand, technology is driving and facilitating the democratization of the very discourses and practices that we have the ability to speak to uniquely. Audiences are diversifying, but not in the way we anticipated, um, and not in a way that we can control, which makes us sometimes uncomfortable, and we don't know what to do. But the question that I feel that has been raised by this conference is whose perspectives matter? We talk about diversifying audiences, but is that, is that just to listen to us, or are we willing to actually change the people who do art history? Um, and I was so grateful for some of the papers this afternoon for addressing that question. So who, whose perspectives matter? Um, and that's really sort of a lot of what this, this session is about. Um, we've seen so many wonderful examples of what art history can bring to the table of interdisciplinarity um, and what we can gain as we make our borders more porous as a, a, a discipline. But we wanted to invite to this final session um, speakers who, who specifically work on the idea of perception in their work and also those who use their work to challenge uh, conventional notions of what art history is and who it is for. Um, and Jim Harris and Susie Lishman are in different ways articulating and advocating for the importance of art history and in particular the discipline of looking, um, analysing and articulating and we're really looking forward to what they have to say. So without further ado, let me just introduce um, our speakers. Um, Jim Harris um, will be a familiar face to many of you, being no stranger to the Courtauld. Um, he's, uh, like many an academic, he has uh, a very long job title. Um, he's currently the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Teaching Curator in the Ashmolean's University Engagement Programme. Um, very impressive. Uh, he, <laughs> he wrote his PhD thesis on the polychrome sculpture of Donatello at the Courtauld and subsequently then held um, the, an Andrew Mellon Research Forum postdoctoral fellowship. And his research employs um, very close-looking technical examination of sculptural materials um, alongside archival work to talk about issues of art intention and how objects shift in meaning. Um, he's also become very interested in talking about how objects open themselves up necessarily to interrogation from different disciplinary and methodological standpoints. And so you can um, gather that Jim's going to have a lot to, to say to us um, about what art history is and who it is for. 
our second speaker is Susie Lishman, um, named by the Health Service, Service Journal as one of the most inspirational women in health, one of the most influential pathologists in the world by the pathologist, and awarded the Royal Society's Cone Medal for public engagement. Susie was also recently awarded the Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2018 for services to pathology. And she's just recently completed a three-year term as president of the Royal College of Patholo Pathologists, during which time she was really active in public engagement, raising sort of awareness and understanding of the vital role that pathology plays in modern healthcare. And so if Susie's resume hasn't already made you wonder what exactly you've been doing with your life, um, she's also managed to take courses in art and history on the side. So you can see why we're really excited to have Susie here to talk to us today about why doctors need um, the skills of sort of perception, articula articulation and empathy um, as much as art historians and how doctors should learn them. And we're really hoping that she's going to prescribe mandatory short courses at the Courtauld. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over now to Jim. Um, thank you, Jim. I'm very much looking forward to adding uh, Susie Lishman's warm-up act to my long <laughs> job title. <laughs> um, it's kind of a commonplace about art history that we occupy a necessarily collaborative discipline. That is to say, to be an art historian, you will always rely on the work of others in philosophy and theology, in material science, in all sorts of other areas of specialism which find a focal point, a meeting point in the objects of our study. And therefore we are always, to some extent, looking out from our own discipline into other people's disciplines in order to feed our work. The job that I occupy at the Ashmolean Museum is, uh, in a sense, uh, the opposite of that. That is to say, I am responsible for thinking about how the collections of that museum might be useful in the teaching and research of Oxford University, and therefore about how the art historian might be useful to other people. In other words, not how their disciplines might feed ours, but how ours might feed theirs. How the objects of our study might usefully be interrogated, as Neve said, from other disciplinary standpoints. And what those standpoints are is one of the most fascinating things about the encounters I have daily with members of the Oxford faculty from all kinds of disciplines and all kinds of divisions. This is useful for the museum because the perceptions and the perspectives which we gain from interaction with our academic colleagues help to feed our understanding of the objects and if our responsibility as a museum is then to interpret those objects for as wide as possible an audience then Everything that people tell us about them, the way they see them, the way they understand them, is grist to our mill. As the custodians, though, of specialist knowledge about objects, about things, about the contents of a museum, we are useful. And what I want to talk about today is really some of the collaborations I've been involved with, which have, in some way, brought to bear the usefulness of art history on other people's disciplines and have allowed us, me as an art historian, to look at the things that I study in a different way. This uh, print, which I started off with, of um, uh, rope dancers and balancers, Transylvanian rope dancers in Italy in the 17th century, um, is a case in point. This was the focal point for a collaboration which I'll come to later on. My title says Agile Objects and Agile Art Historians. What I mean by an agile object is simply an object which will lend itself to any number of interrogations. This is the object which I've worked most with over the last six years in Oxford. It's never on display because we have a better one which is on display, in which the gilding is still intact, in which the enamel is unchipped, and which still has its hinge pins. Because those things are missing, this object is much more visible to us. We can see through the gilding to the seam which runs down one side and tells us that essentially this cylinder was made of a single flat strip of metal. You can see, because the gilding has been lost, where the rivets are which attach the hinging points. You can tell the difference between the manufacture of the lid, which is cast, and the manufacture of the cylinder, which is forged. All these things 
come into view because this thing is knackered. It becomes more agile because it is old and broken. Its agility has lent itself to these kinds of inquiry. I've worked with neuroscientists, historians of art, theologians, classicists, psychiatrists, historians of science, uh, medics in general practice, business people, Italianists, geographers, historians, English literature specialists and medieval Germanists on this object. And we've interrogated it in terms of its iconography, its value, its raw materials, its manufacturing processes and technique, its function, its physical history, the kinds of devotion it embodies, the markets in which it lived, the trade routes along which it travelled, its style and its history of collecting. If we take one of those, interrogating its raw materials, and you unpick the things which are necessary to the making of this object, then you find copper, tin, lead, zinc, cinnabar, metallic, mercury, gold, glass, cobalt, alum, iron, sulphate, and wood, and those are only some of them. Each of those has a different interest to a different scholar. I worked with uh, an anthropologist whose specialism was woodland communities. Not on this object, but another copper alloy object who observed that the principal reason for the deforestation in the early years of the Spanish conquest of Central and Southern Africa was to provide pit props to mine the silver and the copper, which were the riches of those lands to be taken away to Europe. And that the woodland communities which those forests had sustained were therefore uh, directly taken from their homes by that mining process. Perception. And what we perceive, how we perceive, is one of the questions that I have had to address in this work. Um, but perception not simply as a scientific area of inquiry, although that is one of the things that I've worked on. Perception as a science, but also f I find myself dealing with people's perceptions of the museum, with people's perceptions of our expertise, our collective expertise as art historians, with people's perceptions of their own and other people's research when we bring them together in the museum into conversation over objects which act as a neutral ground for them to talk and their perceptions of objects themselves, the way in which they approach them, the way in which they choose to interrogate them. Some of the things, therefore, that I've done are these. This was an experiment in change blindness using objects from the Ashmolean's collections. Change blindness is that neurological phenomenon in which we notice some differences between things and not others. If you look at a picture twice and something has been changed in the picture in between those two viewings, the question of whether you notice it or not goes to the question of change blindness. This experiment involved uh, pairs of objects arrayed around the room, these kinds of things, objects which were very similar but not identical, and it involved a controlled viewing condition in which one person viewed the objects, one person viewed the objects on a screen, and then the determination was made as to whether there was any difference in uh, recording change blindness as to whether you were looking at live things or whether you were looking at two-dimensional things on screen, and also whether there was any difference between people who worked in the museum and were used to looking at objects and people who just came in as punters from other disciplines. This was an interesting and useful experiment run by uh, a medical student who has recently published that work. Uh, this kind of use of the museum and use of art historical expertise to gather the material is a way of dealing with one aspect of perception in a very direct way. The way we perceive other things, though, the way we perceive the museum as a useful entity in itself is something which has uh, been useful and interesting to explore in collaboration with psychiatrists. I've done a long five-year project with consultant and core trainee psychiatrists uh, who come to the museum regularly, three times a term. They choose a theme. The theme is something pertinent to their practice, which might be to do with family, might be to do with violence, might be to do with gender, body image, Whatever it is that they come up with, I choose images, usually from our works on paper collection, prints and drawings, and then we look at them together. And the conversation belongs to the psychiatrists. That is to say, this forms part of their necessary continuing professional development program. However, that conversation varies vastly depending on the mood of the day. 
Sometimes they will come in and we will get to one image and they will then talk about their practice for an hour because the image will spark something. Sometimes they will come in and they will step back from practice and we will look at the images together and I will serve as an art historical interlocutor for them. It's entirely variable. This Rembrandt is a case in point. We use this in a session on uh, old age in which a number of geriatric psychiatrists were present and as soon as this came up the question of whether this man was sitting or not and how he was sitting came to the fore and the discussion thereafter focused on how one as a psychiatrist relates physically to one's patient when they come in what do you do do you stand do you move towards them do you stay behind your desk when they sit do you sit do you sit near them or far away from them how do you uh, reflect or contradict their own body language in order to make the session as productive as possible Rembrandt gave us that Michelangelo and I realize I have chosen stars here which is a bit unfair but most of the time or a lot of the time I'm using much more prosaic uh, printed material we used this in a session on grief, unsurprisingly, and the focus on the varieties of grief that came out of this drawing led to an enormously productive and rather moving discussion amongst the specialists. Their idea of what the museum is for has been transformed by this kind of work, which is theirs. It was suggested to me by a psychiatrist. I work with two psychiatrists to plan the sessions, and they form the focus of the discussion. The museum has become theirs during the course of this programme, which is uh, a strange and wonderful thing. This has also been published uh, the year before last in uh, the Journal for Medical Humanities. The question of how we perceive our expertise and how our expertise is perceived is another uh, way in which the museum has been a useful tool for getting members of the university to think in a different way about their own disciplines. Uh, this is a title page from a lecture series which I gave in January with a colleague from the English faculty, Abigail Williams, whose recent work on the social life of books in the 18th century has led to um, a really wonderful book and who is deeply interested in the way in which material culture is reflected in 18th century literature. And we gave a series of lectures which touched on other things, uh, which led us into a long and uh, very exciting exploration of pineapples in the 18th century. Uh, old things, for which the Ashmolean is a perfect place because here's Piranesi's etching engraving of um, one of the Newgate candelabra that were kind of manufactured by the Piranesi workshop in the middle of the 18th century and passed off as furniture from Hadrian's villa at Tiffany. Here is, um, here's an illustration from Pope's uh, Pope's translation of the Iliad, an illustration of uh, the Shield of Achilles, one of the key ekphrastic passages in all ancient literature, um, which was attempted to be made into a picture here by Nicholas of Lugos. And then again we were able to go downstairs to uh, another part of the museum and see this object, which is Flaxman's great uh, attempt to recreate the shield of Achilles uh, for Rundle Bridge and Rundle, the crown jewellers in the early 19th century, who produced, uh, first of all, a brass, a bronze cast of Flaxman's design, and then having established that it was possible to cast it, made it in solid silver, and then gilded it and sold it to the great crown princes of Europe. That's 743 Troy ounces of silver right there. Being able to bring together for scholars in the English faculty the objects that they read about, the objects that they therefore write about, has been a great privilege. This is not just great art and this is not just expensive things. One of our lectures was on common things, popular culture, piety and the art of the everyday. We looked at uh, bad Wesleyan ceramics from the early 19th century and we looked at Oh, uh, I think I've lost a page. Never mind. We looked at things like advertisements from 18th century broadsheets that dealt with quack remedies. And we thought about the ways in which they advertised themselves by offering free books to their customers. And then thinking about the same books being advertised and offered by competing brands of, uh, of quack remedies. 
if this perception of uh, our expertise, this uh, increasing desire to use the expertise of art historians and museum specialists amongst members of the faculty is one aspect of us going out, if you like, into the university. Uh, another is that we are able to bring people into the university and a good deal of my work has been to do with offering skills training for early career researchers and for faculty members in using objects in their teaching. I run a course called Eloquent Things, which brings together a group of early career researchers and faculty members uh, for a week, or for half of a week, because it's every morning. Um, we look at the conservation issues around handling objects in a class. We look at uh, the lines of communication in a museum, the practical things which you would need to do in order to have access to anything. And then we look about at the ways in which each of their disciplines might think about the object differently. And then I place them in two groups, in, in, sorry, in pairs, in which two members of different disciplines prepare a piece of teaching together on a shared theme, using three objects. The objects chosen before they know what the theme is, which is mean of me, I know, but I'm a mean person. Um, these two slides, though, illustrate an outcome of the Eloquent Things course, which is this, crassis. Crassis is a Greek term which denotes a good mixture, the kind of mixture that you get of water and wine in a symposium when you have just the right balance. And crassis is a scheme whereby each term eight doctoral candidates, postdoctoral researchers come to the museum from a variety of disciplines and are put together with 16 undergraduate students. We then divide that group into two, and each group then runs four symposia, which last for an afternoon, which are based around objects in the museum, and each of which addresses a single theme across the term from the perspective of its leader. It's uh, the scholar whose research uh, is at issue that week. In this instance, we're looking at a 19th century Japanese painting. And in this one, later in the same session, uh, one of the students is being dressed in a kimono by a Japanese study specialist. Later on in that session, we went to the galleries, um, having seen, uh, having watched some no theatre, and spent 15 minutes standing in front of a single object, motionless, without speaking. Um, which is an interesting exercise. The movement teachers from Central will be familiar with the exercise of stillness. Um, and it's something that I learned learning their discipline. Um, if you stand still in front of something for 15 minutes and look at it, a number of things happen to you, one of which is that you become deeply involved with that object. I'm not looking at Yoast for any particular reason, sorry. Um, the other of which is that you become part of the museum. You cease to be yourself and you start to be an object, and people moving around the museum have to take you into account. So if four of you are gathered around a case, you will notice that people come, stop, move around the back of the case rather than going through you. But if they come back, they'll pass in front of you. Because by that stage, they've stopped thinking of you as a person looking and started thinking of you as a motionless thing that just happens to be there. This kind of symposium, which uses the gallery spaces, the study rooms, objects on display and off display, and which addresses the research of particular individuals. This was led by, as I said, a Japanese studies uh, doctoral candidate who works on medieval Japanese literature, is a way of both unpicking the research of the individual for the undergraduates in a way which English undergraduates seldom have a chance to do because English undergraduate degrees are so focused. And it also gives the researchers the chance to speak to a single theme across disciplines with their colleagues during the course of a term. One of those, this term, was on the theme of transformation. We approached transformation from any number of angles, but one of which was the transformation of the body. And here we are back with acrobats, balancers, and body contortionists in these 17th and 18th century prints. This session was led by a doctoral candidate in music who works on contemporary opera and circus, and who is herself a circus performer and an acrobat. Finding a resource of uh, nearly 20 of these uh, acrobat prints in the museum uh, in the spring term of this year uh, was uh, a last boost into her submission, actually. So she's included this stuff at the last minute in her thesis, which I'm thrilled about because it brings this into uh, the public arena in a way which it hasn't been since Francis Douse bought these prints at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries. Occasionally, the question of our research, what we do as art historians, intersects through a single object in a very fruitful way with other members of the university. This silver bowl, 
inlaid with casts of Roman coins and this religious medal in the middle here is a case in point. Looking at this in a single class led by a historian on Renaissance material culture led to a research project in which we thought about style and design this grotesque handle. We thought about the religious implications of this medal which was made in 1547 in a town which was a hotbed of radical Protestant preaching in Bohemia and tied those things into the question of the Roman coins which are embedded in the bowl and which seems to comprise a small collection to which the silversmith had access. 16, medals in the, 16 coins in the bowl but only 10 coins, some of them being repeated. This research project led us to talk to economic historians, uh, historians of religion, theologians, historians of style and taste, so other kinds of art historians, um, and also historians of technology, because the town in which the medal was cast, struck, uh, was also the town in which Georgius Agricola did all his research for his great work De Re Metallica. He was the town doctor and his research was in the mines from which the silver came, of which the bowl was made and from which the medal was struck. Finally, the question of how people see objects and therefore how they see the world is also one of the questions which I've been able to address in collaboration, in this case with medical colleagues. Uh, in the fifth year of their medical training, when medical students are on rotation between specialisms, uh, they have a stopping off point in neurology. And when they are in neurology, they have the opportunity to come to the museum and spend some time looking at objects and thinking about the way in which it's possible to acquire a language for description, which is useful to them in their practice. And the stepping off point for my colleagues in neurology was that if you are a junior and you are on night shift and you have to describe some kind of a scan to your principal over the phone in the middle of the night, you have to do it in a way which makes this thing visually accessible to the person you're talking to. And this is not an easy thing to do. I'm sure Susie's going to speak to this same question. So what we do is we bring them together with two very complicated objects. This is one of them. It is an inkstand with its top half uh, comprising uh, a bronze figure group after a model by Giovanni Fonduli da Crema, who always sounds like a dessert, but is in fact a late 15th century bronze caster. It's an object which is very hard to describe. Yeah. These mythical beasts are a problem. The way in which they're joined is a problem. This figure group is a problem. One group spent 20 minutes trying to describe the chair on which Pan was being chastised before we said, you'll have to say something else, otherwise you won't get to the end. The other object we use is this. It's a uh, small bronze by uh, Yu Ming, contemporary Chinese sculptor of two figures engaged in Tai Chi. These contrasting objects we ask the students to describe in two groups. The groups don't see each other's objects. They write down a description. In the next stage of the exercise is they read their description to their colleagues and then their colleagues have to draw the object according to the description that they've been given. This takes quite a long time. This is an exercise which spins out over about an hour and a half. Uh, here they are reading their description to this lot, this lot are puzzled because describing this thing is a difficult exercise. And here they are looking at the drawings that they've made. I'm afraid you can't see the drawings very well, but actually the inkstand people did really well in this one. And these are the descriptions. It's very interesting the tactics, the strategies people adopt for describing these things. The people with the Ju Ming sculpture very often go for measurement. The people with the inkstand very often go for uh, a much more kind of uh, adjective-rich, descriptive language. Both groups, however, have to bring something which is, to their interlocutor, fundamentally abstract into real three-dimensional life. And this is part of what they will encounter daily in their medical practice. The way in which this feeds into their training, therefore, is to equip them with one of the skills which we, as art historians, take for granted. That is, that we can see something and describe it. Actually, we're not as good at it as we think we are. Um, if you ask a first-year undergraduate to describe a picture, the first thing they will tell you are five things they cannot see, which are to do with uh, provenance, authorship, ownership, um, location in the gallery, all those things, before they get to the 
actual thing itself. And when they do get to describe the thing itself, they will tell you what's in the picture and they won't describe the whole object. So you'll get nothing about the frame, nothing about the thickness and heaviness of the object. We take it for granted, but describing is a learnt behaviour, it's a learnt thing. The extent to which we're able to communicate that skill is one of the things that makes us useful. It's one of the things that makes our discipline as vital to everyone else's as everyone else's are fundamentally to us as our historians. Thank you very much. Wow, well, how to follow that? Um, <laughs> um, I am, I hope, the light relief at the end of uh, a long, hot day. Uh, and um, we'll try not to keep you from your drinks for too long. As you've heard, I'm, I'm Susie Lishman. Um, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. You've already heard some stuff. Um, some of the sim similarities I see between pathology and art, pathology being what I do. Uh, what doctors might learn from studying art and what we're trying to do about it. And it's been particularly interesting to hear what Jim is already doing about it. And then I'm happy to answer any questions. So the story starts when I was, I think I'm about 11 or 12 here, um, and I knew I wanted to be a doctor. And so straight away, I knew what subjects I had to study at school. At the time, I was told I had to study Latin, because I wouldn't get into university without it, as it happens by the time I got there, you didn't need it. Um, but humanities, art, out, out. You know, that was not what uh, I was going to do, and um, my career path was pretty much determined for me. Um, I went to Cambridge, I went to a state school, and was one of the few people there to, to go to Cambridge, um, where I qualified as a doctor. And I am now a histopathologist, I've been a consultant for 20 years, I work in Peterborough, and uh, I spend most of my working day looking down the microscope, making diagnoses from tissue that comes from the living. Um, I, as you've heard recently, was the president of the Royal College of Pathologists for three years, so um, providing national and international leadership for the practice of pathology for professionals working. And I've always had an interest in art uh, and art history, and I did my uh, Open University dissertation on, um, well it was going to be, <laughs> on, um, uh, Everything that was happening around the year 1500 and the end of the world was nigh. Um, and then I thought, well, actually, Florence is a really great example of what was going on at that time. And then I thought, actually, Botticelli, he, his work really um, illustrated the change of what was happening. And that actually, this painting by Botticelli um, really sums up everything that was going on in Europe in 1500. And I thought, but it's got this really interesting Greek inscription on the top. I'll concentrate on the inscription. And in the end, my dissertation was on the gap in the inscription. There is one word missing. It's believed to be genomenon. He was cast down, and I don't believe it. So my, uh, <laughs> my dissertation was on what that word is, uh, or what it isn't. Um, but all of those things that I've talked about were all relevant to that word. Um, uh, and, um, but I clearly have a pathologist's eye for detail. Um, <laughs> And I um, have always loved art and art history, and I'm very proud now to be a trustee of the Association for Art History. If you're not a member, join now. Um, and um, coming on to talk to you about art and pathology. This is the sort of thing I see down the microscope every day, and I think it is beautiful. We have a uh, limited palette of colours because of the stains that we use, so it's a lot of pink and purple. Um, so up here at the top, we've got um, a papillary thyroid lesion, very typical um, to me when I see these things, I know within a split second what they are. Up here, this is your small intestine, these are the finger-like villi that help to absorb your food. This is a beautiful um, exocrine gland, these little dots in these cells here are secretory granules that are being made actually in the pancreas. Um, it's making enzymes and this is a duct and so these uh, granules are secreted into here and then they can go down and into the gut. 
On this, see the little stripes? This is striated muscle. This is what your muscle looks like, and those striations are the things that allow it to contract and shorten and help you to move. So these are the sort of beautiful things that I get to work with every day. And when I look at something down the microscope, obviously I, you know, I trained for six years to be a doctor, another seven years to be a pathologist, and I've now been a consultant for 20 years. So I have many years' experience of looking down the microscope, and I know just as quickly when I look at that that that's a squamous cell carcinoma. It's a type of skin cancer, as many of you will do when you recognise this. It's something that you've learnt, you've seen it before, you know, it's Van Gogh sunflowers, and you don't argue with it. Uh, you know, that's what it is. However, the body and medicine and our cells um, don't always follow the rules. They don't always read the textbooks. And a bit like in art, this is a uh, 1889 self-portrait by Van Gogh, and this is a forgery from the um, 19th century. So it's old, um, but it was, it was thought initially um, to be original. So there are lots of mimics in, in pathology. And so one of the first things we, lose is you, we learn is not ju to jump to conclusions. Um, so here, I'm not sure how well this will work. This is a skin cancer. It's a squamous cell carcinoma. The bit across the top is the skin. So that's your normal skin, and it normally has a little jagged edge and these are islands, these pink islands are abnormal uh, skin surface that started to grow in an uncontrolled way and it's growing down and it's forming a, a skin cancer. So it will form a tumour. And so the things that I look for are, you know, it's in the wrong place, it should just be, the surface should just be up here. These islands are of different sizes and shapes, they're not regular. And these give me clues that this is a form of cancer. This is completely benign. However, even to me, this looks very, very similar. You've got different size shapes. These pink things look like the pink stuff up at the top. Um, and so pathology uh, and medicine is actually very like art. Things mimic each other, and it can be very difficult sometimes to distinguish between the two. Now, medicine has always been <coughs> taught in a visual way, whether it was uh, observing Vesalius doing a post-mortem, or more recently in the anatomy theatres where operations were done and the way that medical students learnt was to lean over the railings and watch them. Um, so it's always been a very visual thing. And one of the things that we try to teach our medical students is the importance of looking at the patient. Now this may sound completely obvious, but in this day and age, they are bombarded with all sorts of information. Scans, blood tests, uh, ECGs, uh, increasingly genetics. Uh, all sorts of information is being given to, to our medical students and doctors about the patient. Where is the patient in any of this? So what I'm trying to do is to get them to refocus on the person uh, that matters. And um, there's a little more experience in the United States of trying to get medical students to, to study art. I think part of the reason for that is that um, medicine is a postgraduate subject in the States, whereas here it's not. So people will have done another degree first, and sometimes people will go into medicine in the States having done an arts degree. Um, and they are clearly students for a lot longer, and so they perhaps have time to fit this in. Here, medicine, you go in straight at 18, it's five or six years, and the curriculum is absolutely crammed. Even trying to fit in an hour um, is difficult. But anyway, five medical school schools in the States introduced um, some art history teaching or some art teaching um, to medical students, and they split the group into two. And one lot didn't have any of this teaching, and the others did. This is Harvard, uh, Yale, uh, and some other universities. And what they found was that the observational skills of the medical students who studied art improved enormously, 38% increase in their observational skills. When they met their patients, they were much more likely to identify what was wrong with them from looking at them. They would pick up signs that the other students didn't pick up. Um, I haven't got time to go into detail about how they did this, but it was a mixture of describing what they could see, uh, describing the context, and then a bit like Jim was saying, um, we tried to show them unfamiliar images so that they didn't immediately say, well, this has come from so-and-so and we know who did it, and, and get them to describe it. Also got them to describe images with the main character or scene blanked out, so they were looking around the outside. 
Um, and another trick, and something I've got my students to do, is to give them postcards and get them to describe them uh, and ask somebody else to draw them. So a bit like uh, Jim's um, activity. But the interesting thing, not only did they find that the medical students who studied art, that their observational skills improved, they found that the control group who didn't study art, their observational skills got worse. So we are doing something to our medical students when we teach them during their first few months uh, and years as students. We're beating out their observational skills out of them. We're teaching them to rely too much on the results of tests and other things. And this is, this is really quite worrying. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, sometimes things are very familiar uh, and it's very easy. You recognise them because you've seen them before. And that is the case for medical students as well. And that's one of the things we hope people will learn uh, to identify familiar things very, very quickly. Now, I was trying to find the least gory images I could find. So I'm, I apologise if you're freaked out by eyes. I'm a pathologist. I have no concept of what freaks people out. <laughs> But I would hope that a medical student uh, who is examining his patients would immediately spot pale conjunctiva. This person has anemia. This one has this brown ring around the outside of the eye. This is copper deposit, um, which is abnormal copper metabolism. Here, this eye is sticking out too much. This person has a thyroid problem, and it's causing their eye to protrude. And this person has fatty deposits, lanthanal asthma, um, around the eye. Um, and so you may wonder, perhaps, what their, what their cholesterol is or what their heart's like. Um, so these are the sorts of things that, that are relatively easy, I think, for students to spot. But there is a lot of ambiguity in medicine, as there is in art. And if somebody comes to see um, the student and says, I'm, I'm tired all the time, it is probably the most common thing that people go to see their, their GP about, tired all the time. They say, well, how much sleep do you get? Oh, four or five hours a night. That's why you're tired all the time. But is it? You know, perhaps this person has got a, an underactive thyroid. Perhaps they're anemic. Perhaps they're running marathons and not, and not feeding themselves properly. Perhaps there are lots of, got, maybe they've got cancer. There are lots of reasons why somebody may be tired all the time. Maybe they've got young children and a job. I mean, you know. Um, but so what we want is students not to jump to the um, initial conclusion that we, we're just not getting enough sleep. That's not the only reason why people are tired all the time. Um, and one of the Hogarth paintings are just brilliant for talking to the students about context and what else is going on. And this is a particularly good one for asking them not to look at the central character, uh, the woman. So this is the sixth uh, painting in the Marriage à la Mode series. So this is the death of the lady. And there is so much going on in this painting. So many of you will be familiar with it. Um, but we're here we have on the floor, we have an empty vial of laudanum, which the servant has just obtained from the apothecary. And the the woman that we're not looking at has swallowed it because she has just read in this newspaper that her lover has just been hanged for murdering her husband. And the apothecary is um, admonishing the servant for going to get this laudanum that has, is killing the woman. There's a baby being held up here by the nurse. The baby's got a little black mark on the face. That's because they have syphilis, which they got from their father. They're also wearing calipers, which suggests malnutrition, perhaps rickets. This man here, who I happen to know is this woman's father, is removing the jewellery from her hand because a suicide's um, possessions are forfeit, and he wants to make sure he's got the jewellery before anybody takes it, and so on. There's a huge amount of information in here, from the awful pictures on the wall to the awful surroundings, the dog, and uh, lots going on. Um, and I know that because I've seen the painting before, I've read about it, I've studied it, I know the whole series, I know the context, I know Hogarth's other work. Um, and what I'm trying to get medical students to do is, is to do that about a patient. Talk to the patient, find out um, you know, what their problem is, but also they need to look at what's happened to them in the past. So it's not just what you've got here today. Your health throughout your life will influence how you've got to where you are. What's your family history? What's happened to, you know, to the rest of the family of this person? And when you go to visit them, are they on their own? Or are they surrounded by several generations of family? Are there flowers, if you're allowed them, or cards, uh, or a bowl of fruit uh, in the hospital next to the bed? All of these things will give students clues um, about the situation and then probably the disease that the person has got. And so what I'm trying to get um, patients to do is to just look at the perspective of the patient 
uh, but also then to focus in on the patient once we've had a look at everything that's going on around them. And really the skill in medicine and particularly in pathology is to learn the systematic uh, approach to dealing with huge amounts, amounts of overwhelming uh, information. And so this is a, a where's Wally? And Wally is, I think it's just there actually. But um, looking, I, I spend a lot of my time looking at cervical smears, just changing the subject slightly. Um, looking at cervical smear is like looking at one of these. You're looking for one possible pre malignant cell in thousands that are on a slide. Um, and so the skills that we have to develop are about spotting the thing that matters, ignoring the stuff that doesn't. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of practice. Now, what was found was that the students who studied art, not only were their um, visual skills better and their observational skills, but also they had better empathy. So they thought about everything else. They were much better at putting themselves in the shoes of the patient and understanding what their illness meant to them. They were better at interpreting the facial features of, of, um, of their patients. And that can tell you so much, so much non-verbal communication. Um, whereas, as we know, the medical students who weren't getting any of this teaching were actually getting worse at this as they went along. And so it's found that students who study art are more open-minded, they're more open to suggestions, to ambiguity, to um, thinking of alternative solutions, and they also come to understand there is no single one right answer. A bit like art, there is no single answer. There's interpretation, there's context, there's everything else that goes to determine what's going on. I use it as a, an opportunity to discuss various biases, which you'll be familiar with, um, and it's just the same in medicine as it is in any other walk of life. You don't want your doctors to jump to conclusions uh, based on any of these. You don't want them to think, well, you can't have cancer because the last two people had cancer, so it's not your turn. Um, or, um, I've never seen cancer present like this, so you can't have cancer. You know, those are not helpful things, so it's a good opportunity um, to talk through uh, all of those things. Because what we're trying to do is to get our uh, future doctors to be critical thinkers, to be open-minded, to be good at problem solving, to collaborate and communicate with others, to be reflective, um, and to communicate very clearly and accurately. One of the challenges in medicine, I think, is that there's quite a hierarchy um, within medicine. We get it in uh, all walks of life. I think it is, um, it is being flattened out slowly. But um, in general, medicals, it's very clear whether you're a medical student or a foundation year doctor or a senior house officer or a registrar or a consultant or a professor. Or, you know, people are very aware of where they are um, on the ladder. And this inhibits people from saying things. They don't want to say, they don't want to seem foolish. They don't want to ask questions. If, if students don't understand something, they often won't say so. Um, and what it was found by getting students to study art and talk about art and for their um, senior colleagues to join in is that it really did flatten this hierarchy and it got people to understand this stuff about ambiguity and there being no single correct answer to things and made people much more open-minded and much more prepared to ask questions and put forward suggestions. And so what we try to do is to just nudge people out of the comfort zone into this stretch zone to try and get a little bit more out of them. While um, what we know is that doctors who spend more time with their patients find out more um, than you can ever find from any number uh, of scans and tests. There is a real pressure, as there is, I'm sure, everywhere towards just passing the exams. And that's what the students say, yes, but will it be in the exams? But in the end, we're training to be doctors so that we can look after patients. Um, that's the job. It's not just passing the exams. The exams are a mean to this end. Um, and so trying to persuade students that, uh, that uh, improving their observational skills, their empathy and everything else will make them better doctors, I hope, will encourage them. There are several areas of medicine where I think uh, visual literacy is particularly important. So if you want to be a radiologist and you're going to spend all of your life interpreting images like this, then you need to be pretty good at knowing what you're looking at. Similarly, if you do dermatology, uh, recognising the various types of rash and eruption on the skin and what they can mean. And as I mentioned, as a histopathologist, this is really what I do all day. Um, 
This is endometrium. This is a prostate cancer. This is Crohn's disease, an inflammatory disease of the bowel. This is a melanoma. Um, and those are things that I can see, as I say, with it, you know, within a split second. But the important thing um, to think about in terms of medicine is that patients rarely have a single thing going on. So you have to, the context is medical as well as social and everything else. So people will have diabetes and cancer and dementia and a family history of high cholesterol and high blood pressure. And they'll be taking multiple tablets. Um, and so there is, there is never just one thing that's going on. So we need to encourage um, our students to, to think beyond the initial thing. And as a pathologist, one of the things I try to persuade um, our doctors is not to request so many tests. It's very easy to tick every box on the request form and just think, well, give me all the results, and when I get them, I'll have a look through, and if any are abnormal, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll do something about it. But getting abnormal test results when there's no link to the patient or their symptoms or signs or what your differential diagnosis is, is a complete waste of time. Um, and you go around diagnosing random things um, that don't really exist. So we really want people to um, really think before they request tests. And the other thing I tell students is go out, look at some art. It can be fun. You never know what you might find. Um, and they like this. So visual literacy, a form of critical thinking, it enhances your intellectual capacity. So uh, I find that students like the idea of enhancing their intellectual capacity, so that can be quite persuasive. But as you all know, and you know, certainly don't need me to tell you, is that going out, looking at art, enjoying art, understanding it a little better is great for your well-being, it's great for your brain, um, and I think can probably try and uh, help prevent some of the burnout that so many of our young doctors uh, are experiencing. So what are we doing about it? Well, as I say, this is uh, the several medical schools in the States have managed to do this. There are a couple in the UK that I'm aware of that offer this course. The problem is that uh, fitting it into the curriculum, as I mentioned. Um, we are using it in pathology in the selection for people who are coming in to histopathology, into my specialty. And so we will give uh, an unknown painting um, to the uh, candidates and ask them to describe it. And we have found by following them through that their ability as pathologists actually relates very well to their ability on that first day at their interview to describe an unknown painting. So there's definitely something. So it may be that we'll be able to use it um, as a bigger part of the selection process because there are so many different medical specialties. How do we get the ones uh, get people into the right ones. There are lots of people all over the country using art. This um, woman in uh, Yorkshire goes out and talks to sc uh, disadvantaged school children who wouldn't traditionally have gone to university and is actually breaking down the barriers uh, by using art and getting people into thinking about anatomy and the body. Uh, and by the end, they all say they want to be doctors because they started to see the relevance of it um, and they draw on each other and it, it sounds fantastic. Uh, one of the things I've done is encourage art competitions. So these are a couple of entries from some recent art competitions that we've got uh, school children to do, uh, just to get them to think about the body, the microscopic world, um, and we've had some fantastic entries. And so quickly coming to an end, this is a hoarding. We went into a primary school and talked to the students about uh, viruses and bacteria and how they could infect your body, and then we got them all to draw them. And it's a hoarding around a new building site here in East London. And uh, it's got little quotes. And this was my favorite spontaneous quote. Um, and I think, I think it's a real shame the way people are made to choose between art and science at such an early stage. And I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Uh, so I am on a uh, one-woman campaign to change that. And so I'll just leave you with my Twitter name if you'd like to follow me. I love pathology. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, do you want to move over to the not so round table? So, such wonderful papers with so many points of convergence. Um, can I selfishly open with a question? Um, because I was really struck by um, 
your sort of discussion about these loss of observational skills through, through training. And so this whole session has been sort of founded on an assumption that art historical students are better at looking. And I wanted to ask Jim, are they? You've, no. been, you've been working with a, a, a range of students. Are we through training actually knocking the observational skills out of them through t theory? And are they any better at looking, please? Uh, not at the outset, no, I would say. Um, and there is, just as you were saying, there is a, a, um, a kind of student who will come thinking they might want to go into histopathology, for example, but who isn't apt. And there are art historical students who are not apt lookers, who are not good at it, um, and for whom it is a, a kind of necessary piece of work to learn how to do it. Um, I think we do leave open the possibility that you can get through um, an art history training and, and not focus particularly on looking, which is not necessarily um, uh, a bad thing in the discipline because there's more than one way to skin this cat. But no, it's not a given that our historians are going to be better at this. And so you're improving your students' ability to look through studying art, but I wanted to ask how, how are they studying art? What does that look like? So um, it's a mixture of um, gallery visits and you know, sitting in front of paintings and describing to each other. Um, and once they get going, they're brilliant, but it's getting over that initial reluctance to make a bit of a fool of yourself and describe things. And, um, and so they will do um, that. Um, then the thing I mentioned about postcards and teaming up and describing something to someone and trying to get them to draw it and then see if it looks anything like, uh, anything like it. So um, who's facilitating all of that? So um, it is generally, and this is where it is quite interesting, it's generally a, a medic, a doctor with an interest in, in art history rather than an art historian who's doing it. Um, but it's largely because it's really informal at the moment. So I was to say, well, yeah. it's fundamentally, in some ways, not an art historical exercise. Yeah. It's That's a skill that I'm art getting, historians yeah. uh, probably should possess. Mm. I said they don't all, but should possess. So it is a skills thing rather than a, a strictly a disciplinary thing. And the question, what do you see, is uh, can be asked by anyone. But that's the key question. What do you see rather than jumping to an interpretation, dump, jumping to an inference, jumping to uh, something which goes beyond what you can see? Start with what you see. And that's a question which is as well asked by a medical specialist yeah. as it is by an art historian. So there's a more general appreciation recently that maybe putting students just solely through the STEM subjects from school to university perhaps isn't, you know, turning out the more rounded candidates that are for, you know, inclusion society that we're looking yeah. for. And so there's been advocacy for the STEAM subjects. But do we think then that taking modules in the humanities is going to have the same effect as what you are doing, which seems to be so effective? But perhaps if they're taking art historical modules, it won't be. I think one of the things that's been found in some of the uh, research is that actually although I talk about art history because that's my interest, it doesn't actually matter which of the humanities. If people go and play the oboe or, uh, you know, play music or actually listen to music um, in a, you know, in a sort of organised way rather than just having it on in the background, these things all help with empathy and uh, with, with many of these skills, possibly not with the observational skills in quite the same way, but with the other benefits, it is just getting away from science, seeing the bigger world, uh, Acknowledging some beauty in another form uh, seems to seems to help. Mm, it's wonderful. And so you're such a skilled sort of advocate and sort of, of art history. But do, can you tell us then? You, you know, you've been working with a lot of public-facing sort of advocacy work. Can you tell us as art historians what you think we could be doing uh, better or doing more of to advocate for art, the importance of our discipline in the public arena? Well, I mean, if you're an academic art historian or if you're linked to a university or near a hospital, go and offer your services. Uh, you know, go and talk. Every hospital, no matter what, whether it's a, a teaching hospital or not, will have lunchtime lectures, they'll have all sorts of things. Go along and talk, go and offer. Um, and people have an interest in this, they have, you know, just a, a, out of general interest. Um, but also, I think there's a real appetite to, to learn more. Yeah, wonderful. So let's open it up to the floor. Find that you can teach observational skills through art. Can you sort of see that people improve, that they actually learn through art to observe and to describe? Is, this, is, it, is it a skill that's actually teachable within a certain period of time? 
My experience is that it is. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think if you practice it, yeah. then you learn it. If you acquire, as I was saying with, with, with the neurology students, if you acquire a language with which you're comfortable, with which to describe things, and you use it again and again, then yes, you become better at observing. When you go to an art gallery or, or an, an, any part-time, I was another job, a good job, right, so, um, when you go to an art gallery or to an exhibition, sometimes there are talks, not often at a time which is um, often they're on the weekday at the lunchtime you can't get them. They are they are usually when you get them really good about telling you to look at this and know that and especially if there are two paintings side by side, look, he's done this or she's done this, but they've done they're looking at the same subject in a different way. How can we bring more of that into the Public, the public world, as it were, or, or, or specifically to people who are trained in different disciplines? I, I, I don't no. know a valid answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> but whenever I've been and sit back, for example, at the National Gallery, when they have special evenings, <coughs> this sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm not always a friend, but each other friend somewhere. And obviously, they're the people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but when you go along, it is, um, they're only about 15 or 20 years, and they're just talks, comfortable talks, just talks, or just sitting on the stool on the floor. And when you see them compared to, 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 to works of art, it is, it's a festival to be fun, but it is makes you look at things differently afterwards. Yeah. yeah, and there's a huge question about value in terms of expanding it beyond the academy, because what we've been talking about is wonderful, but yeah. how do we not just take art to normal people, but to the skills, the art historical skills of looking mm -hmm. beyond the academy? Like, what is its purpose for other professions? Um, yeah, so I think it's a great question and one to, to think about. Can I just add to that? Because I, I got... Uh, Frustrated that they are in the in the National Gallery in the shop they still have John. I mean, it's a fantastic book, but it's all with John Berger's way of, way, of, way of seeing, and you just and it's still the one that you, you go to in order to in order to see deeper or to look. And I don't know what is it, 1970s or mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that book, John. Maybe we should. Maybe yeah. we should. A collaborative book, <laughs> wonderful output. We did a television programme, yeah. that's why uh, it was just to a big wide audience. Please. I, I think related to that, I think that's part of the other failure is art historian sort of coming up with something that's engaged people. Yeah. And so I, I want to ask a, a different question, which goes back to the first question, and it's the art question. Um, you know, as you know, art historians debated at great length whether we do a history of art, art history, visual culture, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But my question to you is, is what you get and what you lose through framing your exercise in terms of the museum, the gallery, art, with a capital A. And it seems to me lots of the sorts of virtues, epistemic virtues that you've been describing, um, could be gained in all manner of different ways. Looking out of a window, describing each other, mm -hmm. uh, describing everyday yeah. objects, yeah. responding to film, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, in terms of your practice, my question for you would be, what do you get through thinking about this in terms of art specifically? Uh, but, and, and what do you lose, you know, in terms of putting people off or intimidating people? Um I mean, I think I, I certainly do. Uh, I do quite a lot of object handling sessions where I'll take along uh, instruments, some scientific and some not. Um, and firstly, I'll get people to try it. So I, I have a, a bag of post mortem instruments, for example. Um, and in there, I slip a couple of things from the kitchen. Because actually, a lot of kitchen items look, you know, stainless steel, clinical, they look like the sort of thing you might use. And I get students to have a look at them uh, and uh, try and work out what they're used for. Uh, and I mean, as I, I was mentioning earlier, I mean, I think a lot of the point, it doesn't actually have to be art. And so, you know, you know it, it's just the thing that I personally happen to mm -hmm. enjoy and be interested in. Uh, and so I use it um, to, to get people to think wider um, than, than science. But I don't think it has to be elitist and exclusive, and I think there are all sorts of ways. So I buy postcards 
uh, when I go of interesting looking things. Uh, so I'll buy the odd postcard of this thing. I tried. I look when I go to galleries. I look for the postcard as the image that nobody will remember, that nobody's seen in a book, and they won't immediately know what it is because that's the sort of thing that I want the students to look at. And so that's easy and accessible. I don't have to go to a gallery. I'll get them in the room and I'll hand out my postcards. Yeah, I love them postcard thing. I mean, I use museum objects because I work in a museum yeah. um, and it's my job to do that. Um, I think one of the things that I would say about the kind of work that we've been doing in the Ashmolean in these last few years is that it does actually demystify the museum to take people behind the scenes, to show them things which are not in a case and to encourage them to look and to touch and to handle and to be critical of things. Because sometimes I use objects that are not on display because they are knackered and rubbish. And the museum is full of them because our collecting policy has been so eclectic over the years, and all museums are. So there is a sense in which you can use the museum to, to demystify art. But I think you're quite right that whether things fall into the category of art or not, whatever that is, is in a sense neither here nor there. You use the tools which are to hand, which might be a postcard or might be whatever you have in your pocket. Mm -hmm. I taught a session with some high school teachers in New Jersey last year in which we asked them all to bring their own objects and then asked them to get into groups with three objects that they happened to have brought and to devise again a class for one of their disciplines and one of the groups which comprised a, a linguist, a mathematician and a literature person who variously brought a, a keyring of the Eiffel Tower, a stone from a river and a damaged golf ball devised a class about time which was absolutely astounding and which dealt with uh, mathematical formulae, with geological time, with the instant it takes a golf club to damage a golf ball and with that kind of historical time that transforms the Eiffel Tower into a keyring. And they did all that in half an hour between themselves with things that they literally had in their pockets. And so it can be done in, in any kind of context. The key is that it's object-based, from my point of view, because the object stands outside you and it gives you something on which to focus. It doesn't have to be art, and it doesn't have to be in a museum, but you do have to look just as carefully at the thing that's in your pocket as you do at the thing that's in the case. And speaking of remarkable feats within short spaces of time, um, Eddie is now going to draw to a close um, on and um, because we're short on time and thank you so much for such an engaging conversation and one that um, I'm aware that there's a uh, there's wine very soon so I, w I will be brief um, I'm just going to say a few uh, closing remarks um, please speak for about 10 minutes um, so I, I promise to be quick um, I'm, a, I'm a PhD student here at the, the Courtauld. I'm also a member of the, the research forum team. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your thoughtful reflections over the last couple of days. Um, and it's, it's kind of an honor to bring things to a close here. So I kind of want to start by saying uh, that I'm mixed race. With a Sri Lankan father and an English mother, I have grown up feeling like I do not fit into categories that structure, sometimes violently, our lives. My own research is driven by an urge to make connections, pay attention to the entanglements, and abide by the bonds between armed groups in a civil war and its aftermath. Bonds that are often overlooked in favour for neat, totalising categories of identity. Us and them. From our earliest experiences, our relationships with others is conflicted. For those we are dependent on can also threaten us. If they, for example, remove the very shelter and sustenance required for life. One way of responding to this situation is to direct rage, aggression and violence at those deemed threatening or foreign in an attempt to eliminate them. Another is to come to terms with a certain degree of powerlessness that always enters into our relationship with others to learn to live with them 
rather than to lash out. I say this because I think it gets to the very crux of a lot of the conversations we've been having over the last day and a half. Anthony Bell, in his talk yesterday, described the process of collaborating with an animator as being one of having to give up a certain amount of control. He also spoke about his own academic research on medieval conceptions of knowledge through metaphors of violence. And this is interesting. You'll recognize this from Alex's opening remarks. Violence is often narrated to us as a way of eliminating and ejecting what we deem threatening. But perhaps it actually does the opposite. If there is a violence to academic argument or academic contest and debate, or even competition for resources between disciplines and departments, maybe we can think about our dependency on each other and even those on the outside. We leave marks on each other. We produce a body of thought together from within art history and beyond. Maybe that dependency could also be the basis or source of claims for a kind of collectivity. A kind of collectivity, perhaps, that we've been discussing this last two days. Marta Ajma made the case for making alongside research. She described the time she spent trying to recreate the wooden panels she studied to think about questions of labor that were thrown up in the process. Amy Jeffs spoke about how digital technologies like photogrammetry and sketchfab can bring fragile medieval objects to international audiences online, giving people the opportunity to virtually handle and scrutinize artifacts that are otherwise difficult to display. Sophie Hatchwell ad advocated for digital pedagogy, collaborating across departments and with external organizations to embed digital skills and learning in the very processes of higher education teaching itself. The sense of embodied experiences to learning was also at the heart of Dennis Perellin's talk about stereoscope technology, capturing that feeling perhaps of what it might be like to walk into an artwork or an architectural scene from the past. Beth Williamson considered how the relationship between medieval music and material culture can not only build a picture of the embodied experience of ritual and choral space, but also threw up questions about silence, pausing, breathing, what it means to be a body in a space with others. John Kasberg talked about his project, the Museum of Portable Sound, which is tr driven by the idea of resonance between objects, visitors, and the world. A museum is not a building, he pointed out, but the stories that are told. Susan Babai examined the sexual and sensory tensions at play in Persian representations of food and eating, unpacking the entanglements between violence and desire. The lunch that followed allowed us to experience firsthand some of the conceptual connections between knowledge and taste, as well as the embodied experience of eating and digestion. Collaboration was also central to Michael Squire's eloquent and intelligent exploration of the relationship between the disciplines of art history and classics, and his call to bring down the metaphorical and material gate separating kings and the courtyard. Fern Inch made an impassioned call to challenge entrenched structures of power and exclusion in our historical institutions, opening up ourselves to new audiences and different conversations 
through projects like ResFest, bringing what we do to a wider public, whether in London or Belfast, sharing a platform with or giving it over to others. Tom Wilson and Simon Randall discuss their project, Unboxing the Wit, using AI to navigate the collection. Simon explained his daughter searched for portraits similar to her own. The software offering a way of reshaping structures of knowledge to reorient, reorient them around the questions new audiences might bring. As Alex reflected, as art historians, we have our own set of questions. But as we open up this image collection to a wider public, they will produce all sorts of new lines of query. Certainly, last night, we heard an intensely moving poetry performance by Bethany Rose in the front hall, who spoke personally and intimately about her childhood, pivoting her experiences of pain and defiance around an image of a Van Gogh reproduction that she grew up with. Rachel Milnott spoke eloquently and movingly about silence in museums and its implication in the politics of racism. Who gets to speak or listen or dissent? Unpacking the complex and contradictory meanings of silence as an act in of itself, she considered how the enforcement of silence is used to stop critique, like critique of the British Empire, while an ideological awakening in recent museum practice has provided an opportunity to use silence as a tool to put pressure on and radically intervene in entrenched structures of power. Alexandra Gernstein, Aya Tashkarain, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, and Vanessa Ewan spoke about their interdisciplinary project on Rodin sculptures, translating his original works into dance and film to open up some of the kinds of slippages, accidents, and conflicts that are bound up not just in Rodin sculptures, but to bodies, the act of reinterpreting them, and the collaborative process itself. Christian Berger spoke about 1960s conceptual art as both an interdisciplinary practice, scientific, archival, research-based, to name but a few, and a practice which forced art historians to think interdisciplinary in response. His description of Robert Barry's inert gas series, an artwork that released helium and other noble gases into the atmosphere, where it infinitely expands, seems an apt metaphor for interdisciplinary or undisciplinary thinking also. A risk, an experiment, endlessly expanding, and perhaps difficult to contain or control. We might think of knowledge as promiscuous or contagious, spinning and leaking beyond the boundaries and containers that frame its production. Learning itself may have long been associated with mastery, but it is in, in part about being out of control, being open to change or complete transformation by coming into contact with others. I think, in many ways, that has been the ethos of this conference, how we, as art historians, may transform and transform others by staging conversations, contact, and collaborations. I want to leave you with a few comments by queer, feminist, anti-racist theorist Sarah Ahmed. Ahmed's book, Willful Subjects, is a study of will, not just the rhetoric of how the greater good shapes the direction of wills via structures of power, but also about how those who disobey or fail to conform have been condemned for having an excess of will, a position Ahmed believes should be radically reclaimed and reoccupied. Alex mentioned historical associations between discipline and violence in her opening remarks yesterday. The administration of discipline 
bringing down the rod to induce conformity. Ahmed also picks up on the rod as an image, building a theory around the grim fairy tale of the willful child. The story goes that a child refuses her mother's wishes and is abandoned to illness and eventually death. But at the funeral, to the mourner's surprise, quote, when she had been lowered into the grave and the earth was spread over her, all at once her arm came out again and stretched upwards. And when they had put it in and spread the fresh earth over it, for it was to no purpose, the arm always came out again. Eventually, there was only one thing to be done. Quote, the mother herself was obliged to go to the grave and strike the arm with a rod. And when she had done with it, it was drawn in. And then, at last, the child had rest. Ahmed's response is a call to take up arms, to reach out and continue to reach, even when blows are brought to bear. Reflecting on the history of European education, Ahmed considers how the, the schooling of children has long been conceptualized as the process of instilling obedience. She quotes Johann George Sauzes, an essay on education and instruction of children from 1784. Quote, obedience is so important that all education is actually nothing other than learning how to obey. But the rallying call from this conference is to disobey. We, as thinkers, do not fit into neat categories that structure our ways of being. We should be intellectually promiscuous, collaborate, share, and be willing to give up a certain desire for mastery or absolute control in order to think through the ways in which we are entangled with and interdependent on others. So um, I would like you to join me in thanking Alex and Fern for organising this wonderful event and for our speakers and chairs for their brilliant contributions. It's been a really exciting two days and I hope we can continue to have conversations about how undisciplinary thinking can continue to transform how we think and what we do. Thanks also to Alex for bringing Beyonce herself. She's here, she's really here. Um, and she's gonna join us for Prosecco, I hope. Um, so, uh, who's gonna thank Edwin? Well, uh, that's my final job, is to thank Edwin for uh, make, you say his eloquent and very thoughtful and impressively detailed concluding remarks, showing an extreme level of attention to the proceedings over the past day and a half. Um, and to thank a few other people as well. Um, I think some very important things have been said and explored uh, over the past day and a half. This was conceived as a kind of experiment in, um, in exploring the frontiers of art history and thinking about how we can adopt a, as, a, as a discipline a, a welcoming posture to people from other disciplines and maybe a little bit undisciplined ourselves in straying across the departmental uh, divides that sometimes uh, make it so difficult for us to collaborate and work together. And we've thought about that in lots of different ways, not just departmental, but as in, in Michael's kind of uh, uh, wonderful um, discussion yesterday of the architecture of Somerset House. Uh, it's an architecture that is at once kind of welcoming and yet one of closed doors and gates and so sometimes just opening the gates will uh, get us at least part of the way. So um, I think we have had uh, a kind of celebration in a way of the possibilities of an outward looking uh, art history and uh, with that I want to thank again Fern and, and the whole research forum team who've put this on, um, all of the speakers and, and the audience uh, who've joined us in uh, this escapade, to the people who've tweeted. I'm 
very grateful to you as well, because in some ways that forms a, a particularly interesting kind of record of the day, people's observations and photographs. Um, and uh, also to the student helpers who are behind the scenes um, making everything happen. They're putting our, the tables out for lunch, making sure that there's something for us to drink when we go down the stairs in about three seconds. So let's have one last clap and then descend. And also, there will be a surprise for you down there. I'm not going to say what it is, but it's a very good one. So we'll see you downstairs.